talked about how we would retool Detroit when nobody wanted cars anymore. <laughs> but the real change is a heart. I think we downplay the fact that that the psychedelic experience isn't necessarily for everybody. And that people intuitively can be trusted. We did say this in Politics of Consciousness. We said people must control their own consciousness. And all we have a right to do is educate people as to what the issues are and where you can go and what to be careful of and what to be aware of. And I think that we were somewhat insensitive to the issues of the people that weren't really ready to handle this. Um, on my personal era, in view of the pe fear people have of their children, for their children, and other children, uh, was in uh, giving psychedelics to undergraduates. That started a chain and um, I did that for many reasons. Sexual was not excluded. <laughs> now, uh, but at this point, the genie is out of the bottle. Plenty of us know the difference between crack and psilocybin. <laughs> Plenty of us will continue to do just what we are doing, to work on our consciousness, laws notwithstanding. <laughs> Truth cannot be repressed, it cannot be legislated out of existence. Perhaps today Judge Ginsburg won't make it to the Supreme Court. I'm not sure that's bad, actually. And only a few congressmen can admit to smoking grass. But tomorrow it will be different. Psychedelics are a healthy pseudopod of a society. And they have to be honored, and they will be honored. You understand that the government's reaction is predictable and understandable. And I feel pain for their fear of change. But change is in the air. And we can't be hypocritical and make believe that it's ever going to be the same again, because it isn't. I feel that psychedelics, just as our American Indian friends said, that it was a part of his life, I feel they have changed my life in the most profound way. I honor them and will continue to honor them. And I will stand up as a person who has had psychedelics many times more than 400 which is the usual published report. <laughs> I continue to take psychedelics. If I am psychotic, I am a sample. <laughs> but maybe I'm not. And maybe that was the training that was part of my preparation to be a social philosopher or a wise person in society. This meeting is a meeting in which in all of our hearts we know truth. How it will manifest outward depends on our commitment to our own truth. Now, as we face the ecological issues at the times, the political issues at the times, change and potential chaos, people that have already dealt with that chaos of mind psychedelically will be there to lend this culture strength and equanimity in the face of uncertainty.
tonight is to present in brief a, a vision of where they would like us to be in the year 2000. What will psychedelics in the 1990s mean and where will it bring us in the year 2000? And then to backtrack, how will we get there? What do we need to do now to realize that particular vision? So we'll each, each speaker will talk for uh, between five and ten minutes for about an hour or so, and then we'll take some questions from the audience. And the main thing now is to just compare our different strategies, compare our different visions, and see if there are any common themes, how we might go about. Because I do think that we have a significant opportunity here, both with what we heard about the neurotoxicity of MDMA and the death. Those issues might indeed be resolved with now with MDMA, with other drugs, with the research that's happening in Europe. The last panel. I think that we can really make progress if we can clearly think where we want to be and how we want to get there. So to start out, uh, I'll introduce the speakers very briefly for those of you who weren't here uh, this, this morning, this afternoon. Now, Timothy Leary, who's uh, I'm sure known to, uh, to all of you and needs no introduction. Um, Mark Wyman, who's a professor of criminal justice and drug policy at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Mark yeah. <laughs> may not look like a professor of the Kennedy. <laughs> but I can show you. <laughs> Next to him, well, and Mark was uh, in charge of the Department of Planning at uh, the Department of Justice for several years before he came back to the county school. Andy Wild is uh, next to him. He has been very much involved in the use of altered states of consciousness, the use of various substances, primarily directed towards uh, healing. He was at uh, Harvard as, uh, as an undergraduate in a lot of the early research began, and he's now uh, working more on organic plants and healing. Emerson Jackson is the president of the Native American Church of North America. He's a Navajo Indian, and he's been, since 1978, the president of the Native American Church. He's been as much uh, a lawyer and a politician as a medicine man, and he's had quite a role to play in their various legal cases, and in particular, the most recent case that went up before the U.S. Supreme Court, for which we're still awaiting a decision to try to find out whether or not the use of peyote in religious contexts by the Native American Church can continue on into the future, or whether we'll have to sacrifice that as one of the costs of the war on drugs. Next to him is Robert Zanger. Robert Zanger is a psychotherapist who has also started moving more in uh, organizational political spheres. He's with Oscar Janiger founded the Albert Hoffman Foundation, which is in Los Angeles, which is attempting to gather the repository of scientific data that's been generated by the psychedelic research beginning in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and not so much recently. But we often think about the knowledge of the rainforest or the, med the wisdom of the medicine men from other cultures as something that's uh, at risk for disappearing. But what the Albert Hoffman Foundation has realized is that from our own culture, from our own background, we're at risk of losing a lot of this data. And so that's what he's been working on with the Albert Hoffman Foundation. Ralph Metzner was one of the pioneers of psychedelic research, also at Harvard, where he was a graduate student when a lot of the research happened. Uh, he's been quite active at the California Institute for Integral Studies and written some of the best material that I've read on MDMA and has also done quite a lot of work on native cultures and ecological issues. And Terrence McKenna is uh, very actively involved in Botanical Dimensions, which is an organization he founded to bring the, the lore as well as the plant material itself from various endangered areas and for tribes that are under threat of extinction and dislocation to try to propagate those plants and to retain those stories for a future age when we may be more able to do this research. So the panel has quite a variety of perspectives and quite a variety of goals and uh, past experience for our particular 
um, area of interest tonight is psychedelics in the 1990s. So what we're going to start out is to learn from each other and to learn from the audience. And Tim will now start us with uh, his version of the uh, so year 2000, how to get there. <laughs>
They're not organized. They don't know what they want. They all want Cadillacs. Like they all want the yuppies. And I said, uh, well, you're right there a little bit. I'd say 5% want Cadillacs. 5% want Volkswagen buses. 5% want Porsches. 5% want motorcycles. 5% want 10 speed bicycles so they can drive to see their boyfriend or girlfriend. In other words, it's pro-choice. And that's what puzzles the politicians and all the uh, theorists. They can't, you know, what's, the, what's the policy here? Where's the license in effect? It's pro-choice. It's an uh, incredible thing. The astonishing thing about freedom, and I think I can say this for all of us with modesty, prove me wrong. <laughs> can you tell me a group of a thousand people in world history that brought about more changes in, in the direction of freedom than those of us represented in this room, plus the Lenins and the Lilies and so forth. I mean, what we did for human individual freedom. But the paradoxical thing about freedom is, and I sympathize with poor Gorbachev. How about a round of applause for Gorbachev? Huh? She's the one behind the throne. How about Rachel? I don't know if you know the story, but uh, it's about the future. <laughs> so I did a conference in Moscow about uh, three years ago, before it all happened, and there were all scientists and uh, artists and all that, and then uh, Yoko Ono went, and uh, she was the one that got invited for a private audience. Uh, with uh, Gorby and Raisin. <laughs> now, this has got to be true because I read it in Rolling Stone, okay? <laughs> so, and I heard it also from Yoko. She, she was there, and Gorby said to her, isn't it a shame that John isn't here to sing Give Peace a Chance? Whoa. Now, at the time, in the White House, with Nancy and Ronnie, Number one, they never heard of the song. <laughs> Number two, if they had, they hated it. <laughs> the point I'm making is that uh, what we did here in a very disorganized way was heard around the world. Uh, I could go on telling you stories to prove the fact that they listened to what we, they watched, what we were doing here. Now, one of the big lessons that I've learned over the last few years, and particularly in the last few months, is the most tricky, complicated, difficult thing to deal with is personal freedom. We're so accustomed to being told what to do and lining up to get licenses and all that that, uh, like, in Bulgaria, they said, you're free. What does that mean? I mean, is it 400 years under the Turks? It's 40 years under like that. I mean, it, the real interesting, tough work starts when you're free. The easiest thing to do is just drop out and not drop out, drop in and follow like that. And the interesting thing about it is that Gorby learned from his dismay. It went, when you free people, they fucking go in all different directions. <laughs> You're not going to necessarily like a lot of them. <laughs> when you free them, a lot of them just want to come east and want to want Cadillac. Some of them, uh, like the Ar Armenians, just want to kill the Azerbaijanis. They've been waiting for 500 years to uh, kick their neighbor's ass. I mean, I believe in technology, and I believe that uh, what we did would have been absolutely worthless if it hadn't been electronic technology, and rock and roll records, and MTV, and uh, the, even M the, uh, the, the fax machines, and the uh, VCRs. In some of those dictatorships in Southeast Asia, they banned the television, they banned uh, radio, they banned movies. But every village had a VCR, 
And what were they watching? They were watching, I don't know, pornograph, pornography from Hong Kong, who cares? As Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message, the medium determines reality. And uh, I see psychedelic drugs as technologies. They're simply different ways to boot up, activate uh, the brain. So I'm gonna finish now, but what's gonna happen in the next 10 years is a new form of technology. It's going to empower the individual 14-year-old child to suit up, put on a cyber space suit or a virtual reality suit in which you can literally move around the world, meet people. You can have five love affairs in different uh, cities. You can be doing your business. Um, then you take off your suit. And here you are in the physical flesh. In other words, all the work in the future will be done by robots or by virtual reality like that. We know. When you take off your cyber suit, then you can use the body for what it's supposed to be used for as an instrument of sacred communication and aesthetic uh, expression and graceful athletics. In other words, uh, to use the body, even transport your body to do work, is your robot. We mean this. You're a serf or you're a robot. In the future, we'll use our bodies only for sacramental exchanges or drink. To use your body to your work in the future when you can suit up and move around like that would be like using your tongue to clean the floor or your penis to knock a nail in. Do not think that when we talk about electronic realities, that we're depreciating the body. We are freeing the body for what it's supposed to be used for. So what I'm saying is, watch for this technology. And you may think I'm joking or that I'm smoking funny drugs. But last Christmas, 700,000 Nintendo Power Gloves were sold. And kids put them on, and for the first time in human history, human beings, individuals, could put your hand through the screen of the tube. We've all been watching seven hours a day with our nose pressed against it, watching Dan Rather's realities, or uh, uh, Roger Ailes and Lee Atwater and the Republican Party, great or fabricated their reality. Or Last Christmas, 700,000 kids could put their hand through and fight. <laughs> That's all right. McLuhan said it. The medium is the message, and if the kids can do that and play ninja games through the screen, we're going to learn how to do it any way you want. There's a... I must tell you one thing and then I'll stop. <laughs> what about... What about the... We are now in the position that hunter-gatherers were in before there was any kind of artificial tools or habitation. And we're sitting here and saying, hey, I just ate this vegetable. And I could see ahead, you know, the fact we can chip a stone here, that means that pretty soon we can cut down trees and we're going to be living in houses with wood. We're going to be in rooms where you can't see a tree or you can't see a bush. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. We're in that same position now. The future is going to be creating electronic realities. You know, think about uh, In which we will spend five or six hours of our time during the day. Now, that frightens you. Remember this horrible, horrible fact, which Thomas Pinch, Pinch is, by the way, in his new book, Vineland. How many of you read Vineland? Right. Wow. Yeah. The average American watches television seven hours a day. That means the average American in the most enlightened and uh, rich country in world history lies like a sluggoid amoeboid <laughs> with their optical suckers stuck in junk food passively. So instead of doing passively, we're going to be empowered with our technology. And I wish Jared and Lear were here. I wish Eric Gullison were here. I wish Ted Nelson were here. Uh, who else do I have met? Otto Desk, Eric Lyon, I wish they were here. Brendan Laurel, there's a group of people working on this. And uh, what about don't Robert, worry. Robert Heinlein, Going to wish he were alive in here. Oh, yeah. Robert Heinlein, he says. Robert Heinlein. He was an Air Force Admiral. <laughs> <laughs> so William Gibson. How about William Gibson? Hey. How can we have a meeting without William Gibson? And uh, anyway, uh, a lot's going to happen. Mainly, stay sane. 
and uh, look to the new technology and uh, and we love you. <laughs> It's going to change um, as people begin to think more ecological terms. We can begin to think more in, in, in recognition and acknowledgement of our interdependence with all forms of life, and we begin to see that we're um, uh, related in, in, in complex, multiple complex ways with the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and with these various kinds of ecosystems in which we live. Then um, there will be communities of people. There will be. Um, I'm very impressed by this, the bioregional concept. There will be, uh, instead of these monolithic nation states, there will be small bioregionally uh, localized, uh, partially, largely self-sufficient communities where people will try to live with sensitivity to the land in a sustainable way, self-sufficient, sustainable, uh, and celebrate the diversity that exists within each community as well as among different communities. Instead of relying on a medical system with drugs and so forth for their health, they will take responsibility for their own health. They will adjust their diet, their nutrition, they will pay attention to foods that strengthen the body, food that strengthens the heart, the emotions, the feelings, foods that uh, heighten cognitive processes or expand consciousness, and foods or vegetables, intelligent vegetables that uh, facilitate religious experience when created, when ingested or absorbed in a sacramental context, such as we've known for years and years and years. And I'll end by giving you a vision that I heard uh, about three or four years ago by a very wise woman, a seeress, who was asked to um, give a vision of what she saw as the future of psychedelic drugs in our society. And she said that um, what she saw was that these kinds of plants, she always referred to plants, have been used since the most ancient times all over the world by people to um, be able to communicate with spirit, to be closer to spirit, to live in a closeness to spirit and nature. And uh, um, as that has not happened, as they come away from that and try to use these plants for other things or in a reckless way, then the plants, the intelligence of the plant itself has withdrawn. That means they become inaccessible. That means, for example, they've become forgotten, like the mushrooms, the sacred mushrooms, was completely forgotten for 400 years uh, until Blossom and Maria Sabina uh, we, uh, rediscovered it. The mysteries of Eleusis. Uh, were completely forgotten. What was the really inherent, the sacred potion that was involved in it was forgotten until Hoffman rediscovered it. And uh, another way that these things become, become uh, inaccessible is by being made illegal. So, uh, if there are people, and I don't think, I don't know, I don't know that there'll be ever a large majority of people who will want to use these kinds of plants to expand their consciousness, but those that do will find their way to them. And, uh, uh, take responsibility for their own health and their, their own way of life and their own consciousness and try to live lives that are sane and decent and acknowledge and respect the integrity of all other life forms on this earth. to hear McLuhan invoked so many times today, and I will do it again. McLuhan had an idea of what he called the global village, and the global village is coming to be. This is what the crisis that is being presented to us as a crisis in communism is. It isn't a crisis for communism. Communism is going first. But what it is, is the death knell for centralized structure, for centralized
If you think what we've been through in the past year is something, wait till you see what's on the agenda. And I don't mean great CNN feed from Moscow as the Soviet Union turns into 15 independent republics. I mean what's going to happen here. Because what is so terrifying about Gorbachev from the point of view of the powers that be is that he models a leader who can say, we did it wrong. <laughs> Baker was on one of the talk shows uh, after one of these, we did it wrong statements by Gorbachev. And they said to him, well, uh, under what circumstances would uh, an official of the United States government admit a mistake? <laughs> and he said, well, you, you don't understand. You see, we, we have a collective decision-making apparatus, and hence, we don't make mistakes. <laughs> you see? So I, I think that, to, to return to McLuhan for a moment, What's happening is, as Yeats said in his poem, the center does not hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, but as fans of chaos, we should know that this mere anarchy is the incarnation of our goddess Discordia, who is going to pull down the hunting structure that is oppressing everybody. Uh, what I see happening, and it was touched upon by others here, is this intensification of local identification, bioregionalism, awareness of your immediate place, and then no hierarchical structure or identification until you reach the planetary level. I live in Sonoma County, and I am a citizen of Earth. I recognize no intermediate structures except when I have to. So I agree with Tim. I cheer on the people who present the protocols and plead their cases before these gray faced medical boards. But in my opinion, you just circumvent all that. You go around it. It's irrelevant. History has these dominator types by the balls. And you know, history, history is a psychedelic experience. It's, it's a collective unfolding of the dream of our species in space and time. We are at the apex. This is the peak. This is the second hour of the trip. We're going over the top.
who said, and I read to him uh, the quotation, our rebels now are ended. These are our actors, as I foretold you, who are all spirits and are melted into air, into thin air. And like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, the solemn temples, the great globe itself, yea, all of which it inherits, shall dissolve. And like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. We are such a stuff as dream are made of, and our little life is rounded with a sea. Prospero is here enunciating the doctrine of Maya. The world is an illusion, but an illusion which we must take seriously, because it is real as far as it goes. Those aspects of the reality which we are capable of comprehending, our business is to wake up. Our business is to wake up. I really needed that in that moment. Because here I was, uh, near my diagnosis, and he was speaking all the time about death. And I was wondering, is he speak, does he want to tell me something? What should I understand? And then suddenly when he said our business is to wake up, I woke up. And I understood that he was doing his work. And I just had to stay out and just do my job. Our business is to wake up. We have to find ways in which to detect the whole of reality in the one illusory part which our self-centered consciousness permits us to see. We must not live thoughtlessly, taking our illusion for the complete reality. But at the same time, we must not live too thoughtfully, in the sense of trying to escape from the dream state. We must be continually on our watch for ways in which we may enlarge our consciousness. I wonder if all knew then the computer that this would come from this uh, drop in value of the consciousness. I think that it wasn't at that moment. Right? We must not attempt to live outside the world which is given us, but we must somehow learn how to transform it and transfigure it. Too much wisdom is as bad as too little wisdom. And there must be no magic tricks. We must learn to come to reality without the enchanter's wand and his book of the words. One must find a way of being in this world while not being of it. A way of living in time without being completely swallowed up by time. Hotspur, as he is dying, sums up the human predicament with a few memorable words. But thoughts, the slave of life, life, time is full, and time that takes survey of all the world must have a stop. <coughs> We have one more, which is different. This, uh, this was something that happened about one year before he died. He took uh, some psilocybin, a very small piece of paper. <coughs> okay. um, a very small uh, dosage of psilocybin, 4 mg. We were, we were in my studio. Our, uh, our house, our home is gone, and I have the studio to work in. And uh, usually we put uh, sound, of course, flowers, everything is very quiet, and there is the sound in the DVD, the bath, and there was uh, the musical offering, I think. And after he took this, usually there was a, a period of quiet, and I suggest tranquility in this thing, see what's going to go out, what's to happen. Well, this time something completely different happened. To begin with, all of said, please turn off the music, the record stage. And then he began to face uh, up and down uh, in a very worried way. And I, I was trying to, to, to hear what he was saying, and he said the word limbo, and he said the word confusion. And it was very, very strange and different. We talked for about 20 minutes. And then suddenly he sat down near the paper cord, and uh, 
He said, everything is fine now. And uh, the first word, uh, this paper called the Lausanne, the first word that I gave out. You see, this is, I was thinking of one of your titles. This is one of the ways of trying to make ice cubes out of running water, isn't it? To fix something and try to keep it. Of course, it's always wrong. I thought he was speaking about the recorder, so I said, well, let's stop the recorder. No, no, I don't mean that. I mean, the pure life is the greatest ice cube of all. <laughs> the ultimate ice cube. We were, I was there writing my recipes for living and loving, and one of them was called Don't Try to Make Ice Cube Out of the Floor in the River. In the idea of not trying to stop life, which is flowing and changing all the time. Mm. And that, that, that recipe gave me some trouble in writing, and so it was a current phrase with us. The pure light, this is the greatest ice cube of all. It's the mm. ultimate mm. ice cube. You thought you were going to have that today? Well, <laughs> now I can if I want to, but I mean, it's very good to realize that it is just the, so to say, the mirror image of this other thing. It's just this total distraction. I mean, if you can immobilize the total distraction long enough, then it becomes a pure one-pointed distraction, pure life. What, if you can immobilize it, what do you mean? You can immobilize it, but it isn't the real thing. You can remain for eternity in this thing at the exclusion of love and work. Well, but I thought that thing was love and work. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, this is why it is wrong, as I was saying. This illustrates that you mustn't make ice cubes out of a flowing river. You may succeed in making ice cubes. This is the greatest ice cube in the world, but you can probably go on for, oh, you can't go on forever, but for enormous eons, for what appears to be eternity being in the light. It completely denies the fact. It's morally wrong, and finally, of course, absolutely catastrophic. <laughs> Absolutely catastrophic. Those words are said with such a profound conviction, very powerfully said. Absolutely catastrophic. I don't know how you got all these things, darling. What comes into this hard, hard skull of yours? How do all these ideas, extraordinary ideas come in? Well, uh, at least this one of the ice cube I remember very well. I was giving LSD to this friend. And uh, I had this feeling, I just practically was feeling a frozen of water, you know, a river, and he was trying to make such a logic out of it. <laughs> so that he would show that all those people lied. Uh, of course they lied. <laughs> and I had the impression that he was rationalizing water and even trying to freeze a piece of this flowing river and make ice cubes out of it. But you have so many ideas. Mm. Obviously, this terribly hard skull has a hole in it somewhere. <laughs> it's certainly very remarkable. Well, I don't remember if I told you the phrase that is running in my mind these days. I am a thousand people. No, you didn't tell me. But that, that also doesn't make anything very easy, you know, to be a thousand people. No, no, obviously. And when there is no anchorage anywhere, when to come back to after death, I mean, there will be no anchorage. Oh, I see. I see. So when there will be a thousand people rushing in different directions, I mean, anyhow, your hair smells the same as acacias. Your head is very solid. <laughs> because the point is, when there isn't anything like this... Oh, you mean a tangible body? Mm -hmm. yeah. When there is something to hold on. There are a thousand different people going in a thousand different directions, and this is what you have a hint of now, and this, of course, is what is so terrible. But I think that I know, that I know, that there will always be, and I mean this is the extraordinary experience, at least there is somebody there who knows there are a thousand other people going in different directions. Mm -hmm. That there is a fundamental sanity of the world, 
which is always there in spite of a thousand people going in a thousand different directions. And while we are in space and time, surrounded by gravity, we are controlled to understand. But to have an insight into what it is when there isn't any control except this fundamental knowledge. I mean, this is where the Bardos are right. The Bardo is right. You see, you have to be aware of this thing and hang on to it for dear life. Otherwise, you're just completely in a whirlwind. Yes, but how many people know this stuff? Exactly. That is why they say we really ought to start preparing for this. And I must say, I think it's terribly important that through this knowledge that we get through these mushrooms, or whatever it is, you understand a little bit about what it's all about. I think the most extraordinary experience is to know that there is all this insanity, which is just the multiplication, the caricature of normal insanity that goes on, but that there is a fundamental sanity, which one can remain with and be aware of, this, of course, is the whole doctrine of the Bardo, helping people to be aware of the fundamental sanity which is there in spite of all the terrifying things, and also not really terrifying, but sometimes ecstatic wonderful things. You mustn't go to heaven, as they continue to say. You mustn't go to heaven? You mustn't go to heaven. It's just as dangerous. It's temporary. <coughs> Somehow you want to hold on to the ultimate truth. Mm, the ultimate truth would be? Well, I mean the total light of the world. I suppose which is in the here and now we experience. It's of course the mind-body, but when you're released from the body, there has to be some experiential equivalent of the body. Something has to be held on to. I don't know. What does one hold on then? All you can say is fundamental sanity which I say is guaranteed, as long as one is in the body, by the fact of space and time and gravity, and three dimensions and all the rest of it, somehow when you get rid of those anchors, but there is an equivalent of some kind which has to be caught hold of, otherwise the world about you is thin and becomes, what is the word, praetors, the world of restless ghosts, one goes to hell and then in desperation one has to rush back and get another body. To hold on again. To hold on again. Well, this is obviously the best thing if one hasn't got the ultimate best. It's very important if one can, while it is happening, if one can see the outer appearance of it. It's important to look after one's affairs in a sensible way and see their importance in a silly way. But if one can, through all this, see this other level of importance, in the light of which a lot of activities will have to be cut down, there will seem to be absolutely no point in undertaking it. Although a great many have to be undertaken. But they'll be undertaken in a new kind of way, with a kind of detachment, yet with doing things to one's limit. This is again one of the paradoxes. To work to the limit to succeed in what you are doing and at the same time be detached from it. If you don't succeed, well, that's too bad. If you do succeed, you don't have to gloat over it. This is the whole story of the Bhagavad Gita. Somehow to do everything with passion and detachment. Passion and detachment. Nine years ago, with what passion I had long for detachment. As a musician, I wanted to be able to play with all the passion of natural music uh, weeks. And yet, I have the detachment uh, that brings about a uh, respect for the composer's, uh, uh, composer's uh, ideas. And here, speaking of things about the, the Arjuna, the great uh, warrior, and uh, the speech of Krishna, no? that tells him to, to go tells him to go and fight. And yet they should be detached from the fight. One can see what it is. He's not involved even though he's involved up to the limit. Mm. What part of him is not involved? It's no good trying to make an analysis because it's usual as usual. It's a paradox and a mystery. Mm -hmm. One begins to understand that that's the main problem. Where nose is running. <laughs> a 
very good reminder that the greatest philosophy is connected inextricably with running nose. <laughs> One of the things they should have talked about in the Gospel, obviously he was on a mountain, the Sermon of the Mount. It must have been very breezy and cold up there. Probably his nose did run. <laughs>